Welcome to Big Blend Radio's art show featuring Victoria Chick, a contemporary figurative artist and early 19th and 20th century print collector. Today, uh, you know, we do this every third Saturday. We talk with artist Victoria Chick. And today we're kind of doing a retrospective of articles she has written in Big Blend magazines and even pre-magazine, digital magazine, I should say, um, about artists that are connected to our national parks. Our National Park Service celebrates its anniversary on August 25th. And so, yeah, I mean, we're thinking back August 25th, 1916 is the date it actually became a National Park Service. It had different names beforehand. And what's really cool about today, we're recording just outside Hot Springs National Park, which was actually the very first national park, but not quite called a national park. It's a whole other story. But um, it is actually one of America's very first designated places. We all know Yosemite and Yellowstone became the first, but Hot Springs was there at the beginning. And there's a lot of interesting history back here. But anyway, uh, Victoria is going to be talking about some of the artists she's written about for years. And her stories are going to be featured in a retrospective that we're doing with the National Parks Arts Foundation. As you know, we do a show with them every first Friday where we get to interview the founder, Tanya Ortega, and also the artists that are artists in residence in parks across America. Go to nationalparksartsfoundation.org and you will see what we mean. These residencies are incredible. Artists get to spend a month in or just outside a national park unit or different parks too, monuments, etc. And they get to really focus on their craft, focused on a project. And that always changes too, because that's what the world of creativity is. Hey, I've got this idea. And then creativity says, oh, you know what? You need to look over here on this corner. So it's really cool. These interviews over the years have been absolutely mind-blowing, mind-blowing, amazing, eye-opening. Um, they have taken us into archives of National Monuments Historic Forts. They have taken us to places like Dry Tortugas, the Loggerhead Key, which is an island that us normal visitors to Dry Tortugas National Park in the Florida Keys cannot go to because of our footprint. You know, we're, there's only certain places we can all go within our national park units. And these artists get to spend time in these amazing places and bring back these stories, whether it is a photog- like a photography, a painting, a video, a movie, could be a dance routine, it could be a song, it could be poetry, pottery, ceramics, textile art, you name it. Uh, it is open to artists of all mediums, mixed art too. So it's really cool over the years to do this. But the history goes back to the artists who help actually make our National Park Service be here for us to enjoy. Today, we have over 400 National Park units. So Victoria Chick, contemporary figurative artist, also an early cent- a 19th and 20th century uh, print collector, and the person spearheading a project to create a fine art museum in Silver City, New Mexico, which is called the Southwest Regional Museum of Art and Art Center. Check it out. Southwest-art-museum.org is here. And so is Tanya. So welcome back, Victoria, to your podcast here on Big Blend Radio. How are you? <laughs> well, wow, that was quite an introduction. And I didn't I even read one fine. bit of it, right? <laughs> hey, this is cool. <laughs> but, but welcome back. Uh, How are you? I'm okay. Good. Glad to glad to have Tanya here too. Yes, Tanya, welcome oh, back. How are you thank doing? You. I oh. am so glad to be here. Doing really good. We're very excited about creating this retrospective digital publication with all these interviews that we've done over eight years with artists in residence. And this is a monthly show. And, you know, Victoria, you've been on our show since we started. And that's been a number of years. And we've really had to go in the archives (laughs) and actually go, I know you talked about this, right? So it's really cool to have you both on the show because it's a then and now and Nancy, wouldn't you say between both podcasts with Victoria and Tanya, the National Parks Arts Foundation, that we have learned a whole lot about the history of art, the art of today, and then our national parks and our, our you know, his, our history, right? Wouldn't you say the right. art has played a role between both? 
Well, for sure. Oh, yeah. I always, I always look at art as the true history because a person took right. time to oh. paint it. And I look at this is the truth. Like, because you can do what you want with words, not saying there's anything wrong with writing at all. Cause that's what we do, but then you get editors and then things get changed. But once you paint a picture, you painted the picture. And it stands for what yes. it is right then and there. Right. So I think yeah, art, you know, it started on the, the walls of caves, even if you think that far back that people had this, this desire and, um, to portray something that they hoped somebody else would see mm. and understand. You just brought us to actually the beginning. We should actually, before we talk about the um, artists that started painting and, and proposing we protect these public lands um, or make them public lands, we should say, to protect them and also to recreate in, right? Let's go back to the artists who are in where the parks are now living their lives and sharing that. Uh, Victoria, some of your articles over the years have focused on petroglyphs, uh, Pueblo pottery. I mean, mm-hmm. we got all into that rock art and um, pictographs, petroglyphs. <laughs> I call them newspapers, right? right? Um, and I think a lot of parks have newspaper rock where you can go in and go, wow, they were having a full-on conversation on this rock, right? And leaving it for us. So we should say that is actually the beginning, wouldn't you think? Yes, yeah, definitely, definitely. Um I've I've been I've been through 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 some national parks like Zion. I remember the first time I saw Zion, and I was so blown away with Zion. And um and I saw the petroglyphs there, which were quite large for for most of the petroglyphs that I've seen. And that was the really my first experience because it was my first experience in the West. And uh, I was I'm I think I re- with my attitude was a lot like the earlier earlier artists of the of the nineteenth century who who came west because they had heard about about things being so uh fabulous and so spectacular that it, that it brought them out to see for themselves and so they produced a lot of paintings um i I think of thomas moran uh, as being real major um alfred Bierstadt. Oh gosh, um, Thomas Hill is somebody you don't hear, hear about very much. He was really mm-hmm. important. And there was a guy named William Keith. And all these people were, had, had been born in Europe. They came, they immigrated to the United States, uh, some mm-hmm. of them with their families and some of them just came, came over. Um, and they, they all went, they all went, took a trip west <laughs> after they spent time and time on the East Coast, uh, painting can the, get the cat skills and, and other areas back there. So they were, they were blown away with their pictures, <laughs> you know, some of, but they were not plain air painters. They, they drew, did a lot of sketching, a lot of drawing, a lot of color notation. And then they went back to their, their studios on the East coast and, and did their paintings. Mm. But, uh, um, I, I guess when I went, because I was, Writing articles for you, I got more interested in their lives, and yeah. oh. I, I, they were really instrumental in the, and their paintings were so huge. They had they were trying to because the West was huge in their minds, and and uh, and the geography and the and the, the ge- geological waterfalls and and cliffs and everything. It was just it was just too much to do it a small scale. So they did these huge paintings and Bierstadt especially was, he was a master showman in a way besides being a great painter because he uh, put his, put his, put like one painting at a time on tour and he would, he, people could come and see it for a price and, and he would That's exhibit funny. it and, and <laughs> in various places. And, but people, people who, who, who saw it, were instrumental in, in, in convincing Congress to form, form mm-hmm. a national park. And mm-hmm. so, and the railroads were, were part of, part of the picture 
because it, it, the, the building of the railroad, railroads made it possible for people to come west more easily than a, by covered wagon or, or, or by buckboard or by sailing around the Cape of Good Hope. So, yeah. so um, anyway, so it, it just brought a lot of people wanting to see the West and, and mm -hmm. wanting to preserve all the, the places that we really enjoy now. Mm. I, I also think like when you look at Yosemite and there's a famous story of John Muir and Teddy Roosevelt and him getting Teddy Roosevelt out, right? And camp under the stars <laughs> and all of that. Meantime, here's John Muir, the vegan and the, the, you know, yep. the last of the great white hunters, uh, getting together. And at that time, they documented it through photography and art as well. That meeting was documented. And I think that was instrumental too, because it showed the American yeah. people, hello, here's this. I think that gets, yeah. we forget that art documented yeah. that. It wasn't just, oh, did you know that this happened? Well, we don't know. We don't know if, unless yeah. someone was documenting it, right? <laughs> That's true. Yeah. Right. And that is the, yeah. that's the beauty we... also. Go ahead, Tanya. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, I was just Tanya. wondering um, if we uh, know. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, if we know what? <laughs> yeah, you go. I want to okay, know. Ta Tanya, you go. Tanya, you go. Uh, it's it's really good that we're acknowledging the the artists pre National Park Service that led up to the artists um, to both the National Park Service and the artists of the national parks. I mean, it, it, it really, the national parks because of artists. Um, I, I mean, um, I'm sorry, can you hear me? Yeah. 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 You've got you're a little bit of trouble, oh, okay. but yeah, yeah. you're there. Yeah. <laughs> so generally in the park system, the idea for, and, and again, we don't know exactly how true this is, but it is documented. The idea, idea for the park system before it was called the park system was um, generally attributed to George Catlin um, mm. and he's from Pennsylvania before that there was the you know the in the early environmentalist with the free Niagara movement and then of course there was the Hudson River Valley painters and among those like you were saying from from Europe a lot of people came over to join those groups or to be with with those groups which are um you know the artists that you mentioned are were in in those groups but um and that's what led up to the national park system um and i have the quote actually from catlin here um and of course i'm sure he said something before and after this so the context is out but he said some great protecting policy of government in a magnificent park, a nation's park containing man and beast and all the wildness and freshness of their nature's beauty. So, mm. Yeah. Neat. That's and, awesome. And that's so, yeah. And yeah. I've been calling him Caitlin all this time, but maybe he's not part of the Jenner clan. So, <laughs> sorry, not to be a <laughs> Kardashian. I don't know article. either. <laughs> I don't know. But, but Caitlin, that, that is one of the articles Victoria wrote about, and we we all – the three of us, Nancy, you know, Victoria and I got all enamored by George Catlin because Caitlin Catlin. Mm. Um, I mean, really, I, wasn't that one of the coolest, um, stories for you to dig up, Victoria? Oh, it was fun. You know, uh, I'm being, being originally from Missouri and having, a, you know, I didn't live in St. Louis, but I went there often enough. So, so all the all the embarking from St. Louis and on the Mississippi, which I have been lucky enough to to ride on <laughs> downstream, uh, uh, I've I've you know I I really related to to his his journey and what he what he did by painting all the, all the Indian tribes up and down up up and down the Mississippi and and going then eventually following um, the Lewis and Clark route up the Missouri. Mm. So, um, I mean, he, he I, I, the fact that he, he, he was a, he was a showman too, in a way. Uh, he, he tried to paint, he, except he was only dealing with Indians, <laughs> Indian paintings. So, um, I don't think he reached 
quite as many people um, emotionally as as maybe some of the landscape mm-hmm. painters did. But but he but what he did was really important. Well, I wanted to say too, James Weir isn't he instrumental too of the parks in a way because of the plain air painting and um because wasn't he the person that kind of led artists into that like to kind of understand that you could do it so he was kind of like the like the in betweener i i'm not sure of all the dates cuz i'm terrible on dates but um i know that we do have <laughs> where farm which is now i think a national monument they changed from being a historic site um and it's one of the the National Park Service park units that was established on Halloween, by the way, 1990. I think that's so cool. Sorry. Um, but um, we actually did okay. an interview with uh, Kristen Lassard a long time ago um, when Victoria did an article on, on Weir. But um, Victoria, he really did do a lot to help in that way, right? To get, you know, artists outside and start to really understand yes. the environment instead of just looking at a picture. Well, yeah, I mean, he 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 didn't actually call himself a plein air painter. He called himself because he was following the impressionists. Because he'd gone, he'd he'd taken a trip to France for a little while mm-hmm. and came back and brought impressionism back with him. But but basically, what he was doing with impressionism was plein air painting, and. Um, so he he popularized that type of painting, and um, many other artists then started because at that time people were still painting like they they called it realism, but mm-hmm. and they painted they painted pictures that were um, regular scenes of of people doing ordinary stuff, or um, but it was uh, the colors tended to be dark. They were every because bl- they used black to mix. Mix mm. shadows. Make make, oh, make their yeah. make their co- color grade down. So they quit doing that and started started doing optical mixing, mm. and uh, so every, so the so people's paintings got brighter, and uh, were were e- easily more easily seen or looked at from a little bit of a distance instead of mm. because the colors were were not, weren't physically mixed. They were just, the colors were just right next to each other. So your yeah. eye would mix them. I know it's kind of crazy, but um, yeah, no, but it actually but, works. Yeah. I mean, if you look yeah. at something from a distance, then you sometimes see a little bit clearer if you think of it. If you can think of it that way, mm-hmm. even though I mean, it's like if you look at a, a paint by number and they have all the lines drawn out for you with the number and say, paint this color here, paint that color there. And if you decide you're going to do exactly what you're told, then the painting is very (laughs) cold and static. But when you get the blending brush out. We are a big blend after all. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Blend it up. Let's cross borders. (laughs) Let's do what we're told not to do for fun. And let's experiment and then you see that the the blending in a picture makes it more natural than like a paint when paint by number would look like. I think nature taught yeah. the artist, you know, how to actually be part of yeah. nature and be part of it. But this is the perfect moment to go into a then and now moment with Tanya and, and you, Victoria, because Tanya, when we, you know, Victoria's written about, how impressionism came and, and plain air uh, came to the country. And, you know, here's these artists transporting art across the country. Then photography came, Ansel Adams. You've got all these people, Caitlin, Catlin, um, you know, doing all these amazing things. Thomas Moran, <laughs> all these people are doing things. But if you look at the then and now, this is what is so cool to me. We started off talking about the indigenous people of our land here and how they left, you know, messages and art in the rocks in the sand and pottery and all Mm -hmm. these different amazing beautiful ways jewelry that's found so two things i've learned about the national parks arts foundation artists some go Mm -hmm. into parks like chaco and rediscover their ancestral roots or not just rediscover but like get a deeper connection let me put it that way that's probably i think rose uh, simpson was one 
um, recently, Carissa, uh, was, is one, the poet. Um, so there are people that will go Jason into a Garcia. Park. Yeah, there have been yeah, quite Garcia, a few. Yeah. I, lucky, Carissa mm-hmm. Lucky Garcia have gone in and their family history, their ancestral roots are opened up further because they, they literally were taken away. At times, let's think about that. And so then you've got that part. And then when you think about the plein air painters, so there's, you know, people like Alice Lees has done that. You've, you've got, you know, Patricia Cummins. You've got all these artists who've done that. Then you have artists coming in going, well, we're going to do something completely different. So I think what's interesting about NPAF and your artists it, that, that are part of this residency program, they take things to a different level. I think one of the ones that blew my mind was Nick Collier when he put on his military uniform and staged his own oh, yeah. battle in Gettysburg. He replicated himself there now and he's been to battle and he like went through the steps and photographed. I mean, that was, can do you remember that? That was insanely cool. What he did. Oh yes. It. He was, he was wonderful. And the, um, the article, in, uh, um, the video actually is still in, on YouTube in stars and stripes. And every time I watch that video, I cry. Um, so every mm. artist has a different plan and a different proposal. And uh, like I've said before, most artists actually go in with their proposal, what they're going to do, and it usually expands into other projects. And, you know, uh, and, and it is, it's, it's amazing, even if they think they're going to do one thing, and especially if they have a special connection uh, with their heritage with the park. And that's, that's, you know, many parks. That's not just Chaco. So it, it is beautiful to hear these artists talk about and the interviews that you do to hear what, what happens when they are at these residencies. And then when they have, um, an exhibition at the park or, um, at the interior museum who we partner with, um, you know, it's, it's very, it's, it, it's an incredible connection, um, mm. in both of those ways. So like the, the then and now kind of thing, I think the difference with our contemporary times is that there's so many different tools to use. And when you were talking about the, um, the illusion, uh, not illusion, the amplification of light in, in mm. paintings that they used to use, even, you know, in, in Denmark, those old, when they would get a, uh, a light and a magnifying and a mirror. And so it, mm. it did a projection, uh, all these different things. So what I'm saying is um, with the park service, the history has mostly been two dimensional paintings, but right now we are able to, and the park service is very open to learning more about the contemporary tools that we have to express mm-hmm. ourselves as artists at these parks. It is interesting. And by the way, I just wanted to throw in two things. Um, cave paintings we were talking about. I was just reading mm-hmm. this morning. They have recently discovered that even in the, oh, what are the, the, the ones that Werner Herzog did in the cave of forgotten dreams, I think it was called the La Salle caves in France. Um, They're now discovering that some of those paintings have uh, the celestial bodies in them, but Mm -hmm. just as a few stars. And they're thinking that that is a significance in what time of year it was, what season it was that the the, the animals came. And another thing that they just discovered, you guys might already know this, um, Mm -hmm. is that it was a lot of women that were painting and cave Mm -hmm. paintings, which I found very interesting. Mm -hmm. And I didn't even know because I'm naive how they could tell. (laughs) And I guess it's finger length or something like this. Um, But it... um, it's 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 very interesting and and the reason I went back to that is because it's kind of like a then and now and then mm-hmm. and now like you can definitely see not just in the styles but also in the symbolic and even the allusions of um subjects in in the paintings and with like Bierstadt and stuff that's 
you know, hey, go west, you know, and so those were <laughs> magnificent, you know, yes. the, the sun coming through the clouds and the, and so yeah. we have to, when we're thinking about the, the history of all this, like we've got to kind of parse out what the popular style was. So it's not just the you know the impressionists or the realists or, yes, or that it's right. not just the schools it's those details that are in those schools so the details of the cave paintings reminded me uh, you know with the celestial bodies of the of the different styles of art that we are doing today video and different things and how we even subconsciously interject um, symbolism and what's going mm -hmm. on you know just in our culture well, one mm -hmm. thing too, um, I wanted to say when you talk about then and now, um, about the women in the caves, um, when the last interview we did with, uh, Chelsea Bighorn, who was your first artist in residence for Saguaro National Park in Tucson. And we had a, you know, it was like we interviewed her as she got there. And then we did a follow up with her and Carissa Lucky Garcia. Um, and she, we talked to her right before she was on her way to Chaco and, and, Chaco is a really deep thing for her. That's in sense, ancestral roots. Um, and Carissa has been through a lot. I mean, she is a, a veteran of war. Um, she's a poet and indigenous poet and just an incredible force of nature, man. Seriously. She, she's amazing. And the two she's of them. She's amazing. Yeah. And, and Chelsea's got Irish. And I was thinking of you, Victoria, because you taught us all this history of Celtic art, which goes deep. And here she is going to Saguaro <laughs> National Park, looking at her indigenous yep. roots and her Celtic roots, right? So this is, I'm like, well, this is so yes. cool. We got to put them both on a show together, which was like amazing <laughs> because it's the other thing is National Parks Arts Foundation. And you'll see this in the retrospective of this digital publication coming out is that they've created an artist community. I put up a show. Hey, this artist is coming on. Everybody that is part of MPAF, like, oh, yeah, 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 supports each other. They communicate. There is like a family thing that happens, right? Stan Honda and Andy Jarima actually worked together at one point. Stan Honda is an incredible photographer. Andy is an amazing musician. And they ended up working together just on a podcast. It's like, what? And so there's all these things that happen. But it was Carissa and Chelsea who spoke up on the podcast saying that National Parks Arts Foundation, and I think it was also, we had another lady who just did it too, and I don't want to say the wrong name, but they were talking about the fact that your residency program allows women because there has been bias against women because of kids, because if you have the facilities or the lodging for them, like if their kids can come or their family or you understand that women have these different roles and that women for artist residencies of this nature have not been able to really do it over the years, which I found very interesting and did not know until like recently. And women started telling me on podcasts. So I think that's a whole other <laughs> thing we need to look at about it then and now, you know? Cool. Yeah. That's a huge deal. Well, I mean, ton it, it oh, is because you allow families there, you know, in a residency. So yes. the artists can keep going with whatever they need to keep going with. That's huge. Absolutely. Yeah, if is, we are cool. able to do that, we do it. Because, I mean, it's it's just how it has been throughout history. In fact, what we have done, and it's it's, it's hard to do though, is we've been able to have housing um, on private property in parks or outside of the park if the park itself cannot accommodate um, families or, or, you know, mm -hmm. anything that an artist might need. So we, we do our best to be able to to do that and we can't all of the time but the park service has been really really good about being really inclusive with women and families and we we know that a lot of women have been lost their history as artists in the park and we get mm -hmm. emails often that say don't forget this artist and don't forget the you know this artist and some there are people i have never heard of that are in women usually 
um, that are great artists and are being, you know, their collection is 60 years old at some small, um, you know, museum and it's in who knows where. And so it's hard to, to gather them together, but it, yes, we do our best to do that. And I hope we can do better in the future. That Victoria, that's doesn't it, that that's really interesting. To <laughs> I knew. Yeah. Like, yeah. Go. Tanya, that's really interesting because, because uh, when I started collecting prints or graphic work, um, by artists that were done in the, in the 19th century, um, mm -hmm. and the early 20th mm -hmm. century, there were lots and lots of artists. I didn't, I didn't pick them out because they were who they were because I didn't know who they were, but, but I just responded to their, Im their images and I really liked them. And I, and then I researched them after I retired and discovered that they were really well known in their day, but they, they just got lost in history. So I think it's really important to, to make, to kind of, to maintain their, their um, ability to be seen and let let the current people that see it make their make their make their judgment let the art affect them mm. you know that's exactly a, a good example <clears throat> mm -hmm. uh, go ahead nancy well, i was just going to say it's especially important for our youth um, mm. for young girls to be able to see that you can and you can do something that you want to do and you can make it happen. You just gotta have the, the wherewithal, the guts to do it and the stamina and not give up. Mm -hmm. I think it's because yeah. when you do look back at history and you do see most of the paintings were done by men, um, that, that are available easily for us to, to see. It, oh. It's, it, you know, and, and so I think it's important that we take that step and always make sure that that women are included so that young women don't feel like it's impossible. Mm. There are women yeah. who are involved in our parks who have done things. Um, mm -hmm. I, I want to go back to Victoria and Lillian Wilhelm Smith. Um, and I want to big, I personally have to give a shout out to Susan Priscilla Thew. I bring her up every, every year during women's <laughs> history month, but no, it's not the sock monkey, Priscilla, or sock monkey, but I want to no. say she's named after her. <laughs> no, well, yes. you know, Sequoia <laughs> National Parks, Kings Canyon, um, were some of our first parks on our Love Your Parks tours. We travel full time doing this. We've got, we've got over 2000 parks that we've done at this point yeah. in this country. Um, and that's not counting Africa and all that, but, um, Susan Priscilla Thew, Back in the day, you've got to think this was, I think we were still at uh, General Grant or Grant's National Park when Kings Canyon was named after Grant. And she went out on a mule and her horse on her own <laughs> photographing and went out into what is the wilderness areas of Sequoia National Park and photographed as a photographer on her own back in the day. We're talking jazz era style, like goes off. Single woman off in the, you know, I, she was married at, at a time. I think her husband didn't do what she did. She went off, photographed all of this, came back, went to Congress, and that's how they expanded Sequoia National Park and General Grant's area. She also inspired Ansel Adams, and it was mm -hmm. him because she needed a man to do a little purple stamp kind of thing. Um, so mm -hmm. she, I'm, I'm not telling the story properly. So. By the way, people, I will put that link in the episode notes, too. Um, what she did was help expand these parks of what we have now. The Wilderness Act, I think, is over 50 years old now. And that wilderness would not be there if it was yeah. not for her. A woman on horseback riding that area by herself. I think that is art, what she did. And yeah. she <laughs> rarely gets yeah. talked about. There are a lot of women in parks who just... I think the park system is working really hard right now to really document not to, it, women's history as a whole, but in the arts, it's really hard to find. Victoria, you've done really well, but Lillian, Lillian, she did something in our parks out of, we've been talking about so many men. I feel like we need to, to give her a shout out. Don't tell me yeah. Lillian's a man. Well, yeah. <laughs> Lillian, now wait a second. Lillian, Lillian wouldn't have gone there for, for initially except she was the the sister-in-law of Zane Grey. Yeah. And she met Zane mm. Grey in New, York, in New York, 
and he took he took her to Madison Square Garden to see the Buffalo Bill Wild West show, and she oh, got so funny. enthusiastic <laughs> that she he he invited her to come. She started drawing right there in Madison Square Garden, and so he he decided he asked her to go accompany him to the Navajo Reservation because he's about to write a novel in that about that area. And so she went with them. She had never been on a horse before. So they got off the train. Oh my gosh. Um, pro- probably at Lammy, you know, if that because I don't think it went any farther. Um, and then she had, they had to, they had to ride horseback 100 miles to the oh. area of the Navajo Reservation where they were supposed to go. She'd never been on a horse before. And so the, 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 the guy who had the pack, te- pack team felt sorry for her and he, he, he did everything he could to kind of preserve, preserve her skin. Uh, but anyway, she, she, she lasted through that trip. She did very well. She went back to New York. And she was so bored that she couldn't stand it. She, she eventually moved in, in the 1920s. She moved to the Phoenix area. I mean, I can't imagine living in Phoenix in 1920 with no air conditioning. Yeah, wow. But, but, and but she was clothes. a tough lady, obviously, obviously. Yeah. So, um. That's cool. Yeah. Wow. That's way cool. So wow. I, that that's that is amazing, Victoria. When you think about a woman going through that, and I think that's yeah. what people forget about what women were wearing back then, and going through the elements. <laughs> we, you know, now we yeah. complain. My air conditioning's off. <laughs> you yeah, didn't right, have to wear right. a bustle <laughs> like you had to wear a bustle when you rode a yes. horse. Yeah. Yes. We we claim about the humidity being a little high, you know. So, yeah. <laughs> but so anyway, she did the illustrations. The so she was an illustrator. She did like that kind of work and you know that a lot of women did do you think being an illustrator that a lot of times men overshadowed them and in that work and kind of like i did it you know if that if they were part of the publication well you know i mean as far as knowing about people yes i think that happened because because art history was set up sort of the way it was and um the initial the initial setting up of set, set the pattern for women, for men to be more, well, for women to be ignored really initially. And, um, I mean, but it doesn't mean that everybody ignored them at the time they were done, that they were working because, because there, there are lots and lots of women that were respected artists that, that we never hear of anymore yeah. i mean they they their work was in art shows and of course really early there were no art museums in this country really early that's so, why you're look at what you're doing i mean trying yeah, to create so, a fine art museum is not an easy task and you're a yeah, woman in art i know yeah <laughs> yeah so <laughs> so um you know i think i think we're the country's catching up with honoring yeah. honoring people's talent uh no matter what they what the gender they are or what mm-hmm. or uh, what what era you know because we're going back and we're picking up people that shouldn't be remembered we're we there's lots of women artists today that we're encouraging art in the parks is one way and um I, it's yeah. all important i want to i want to go back to the civil war because this is the okay. other thing about the national park service that we forget about that they are keepers of history, interpreters of history, and artists that go there. Um, Tanya, you, the Gettysburg run that you had, which was a long run of artists being there doing documentary. I remember, I remember when you first came on a the show, there was an artist who did the ghost trees moving, uh, ghost trees of Gettysburg. Do you remember that? Oh, there was a yes. video. I remember I watching do. that. Going, um, wow. Like, I'm trying to remember who that was. <clears throat> so what has happened with the Gettysburg program, that program got so popular. Right now we are just um, figuring out funding for it. Yeah. That program really, really was and is still important. So and it brought kind in of poetry. on a hiatus now. We'll see how yeah. it did. It brought in poetry and all kinds of things. And then when we... Also think about the Civil War, even at Fort Union, we just got um, the Glorietta 
Pass was there. That was a yes. a battle. It's a, it's it's amazing. If you go back to the mm-hmm. Civil War, there's a lot a lot of artists there, and it's it's not even though Gettysburg is um, one of the the bigger monuments that we have. It's all over the nation. Mm-hmm. So yes, and that's all I was going to say. Like you've got your artists contemporary now in these sites, right? Even you know, even Big Bend, you did a lot in Big Bend, um, and artists that you did veteran programs too over the years, and and things always change. I mean, we've also had COVID in the middle of this stuff, you know, that really changed what happened in arts. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, Tanya was like, "Holy cow, we can't have a program." I'm like, "Well, we'll just put people on shows. Let's keep going. You know, we'll just do whatever we can. <laughs> you know, let's just keep going. You know, um, you know, it's it's been it's well, the world has and the world has been wonky. We've had all kinds of changes in our country and the world. And so it'll always change. And the art changes with it and tells the stories. And the Civil War is one of them. And you think about the timeline of the Civil War, when the Civil War happened, right? And how, like, the timing of the National Park Service wasn't that long after. You think the Civil War went from 1861 through 1865, our National Park Service came in at 1916. All right. In between then, the artists were going to Yosemite. What, Victoria, I believe it was between 1872 to 1922. I think you were telling me the history of that. 1861, well, yeah. all the way through. Yeah. Yeah. Beerset, Beerset was the one. I mean, he, he made many, many trips to, to, and, not only to, to, uh, to Yellowstone, but to other, other parks. Um, yeah. or other mountains and stuff. And so, uh, he, he traveled, uh, many times between, uh, those dates. And then at the Civil the, War time, here it was, artists yeah. going in and being even part of a battle, painting the battle. Um, one of the recent conversations we had was about painters, Filippito, Filippito. <laughs> Don't ask yeah. me to pronounce yeah. anything on this show. Um, but they did. The, <laughs> This You're doing okay. The the cyclorama at Gettysburg, you know, so I got to think about this history part because I think that the this father and son were innovators yep. in art and changed the landscape literally, right, in what they did with these cycloramas. And that lends itself to talk about this discussion of history of art in parks because Civil War – history is captured within the park site protecting these battlefields right so we go there we get to learn about battles and things that we don't want to see but need to understand because history you know repeats repeat that cycle over and over but you go there Mm -hmm. people painted so part of you know the park service has you know protected this which is which is a piece of art that happened back in the day and then you've got artists like tanya's artists going in the National Parks Arts Foundation, artists in residence going in there. It's like, to me, look at this shift of change, going from plein air painters to cycloramas to poets. You've got dancers going off. If Tanya's like, remember, you know, Anthony going in there, Anthony Green going in and doing interpretive dance and poetry and all of this amazing stuff. But in the middle of all of these changes is this cyclorama, which is an insanity project like how did that happen <laughs> and more more than two people worked on it too so like that's a whole that's wild to me i still can't get past that and i'm mad that i yes. didn't see it nancy well, when we were there we'll we'll go back we'll go back now yeah the history well, of like, cycloramas is is pretty interesting too there was and this is what i mean by um even though there are these these schools of of art um, the details within those schools, which would be the cyclorama, those are the things that, um, you know, we can sit, we can mark time with and go, oh, okay, during the Civil War, beginning of photography, that wasn't really popular yet, so painting was still happening, and then cycloramas hit the scene, and then, it, it, you know, the one at Gettysburg is just amazing, you can look at it forever, and, um, you know, and then, then other artists started doing that too. And then that, that kind of dropped off a little bit for photography, but it is an incredible history with the cycloramas. And Victoria, you probably know all about that. Well, I find it really interesting. Um, 
the, the two the the father and son that painted the one that I'm familiar with, and that and that one has been moved several times. I uh, I read I've read, and um, I think I think it must have been really interesting to do at the time because it, when they were doing it, it wasn't that many years past the Civil War, the end of the Civil War, and 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 I think that uh, there was the feelings ran deep. I'm sure still at that time and uh so so people were were interested because it was so it was such a new thing nobody had ever seen a cyclorama before and uh besides those those guys doing the doing the layout and the painting and they were using photography uh as a uh tool to to get the joins correctly in the in the in the pictures that they they were doing the, the kind of composition so that they would all go eventually t together and as people looked at them in a cir in a circular form so mm. that was really uh groundbreaking for, for them to do that so i mean it, so in a way um I, I guess the Park Service didn't commission that because it was, wasn't there yet. The Park Service wasn't there. Some some guy in in Illinois, I think, uh, commissioned it. And uh, he wanted it in a silo. Was, you know, he did. He wanted it in a silo. Yeah. So <laughs> well, <laughs> he 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 had he had he had uh, agricultural roots, I guess. You know, <laughs> but but I think that's interesting <laughs> that somebody somebody would be that. Uh, innovative, you know, who wasn't even an artist. He he conceived of this thing in the round and how spectacular it would be and to be able to see things that way. And of course, these guys had a history of doing that. They didn't invent they they didn't exactly invent it, but they they were masters at it in in Europe before they came to the United States. Oh, so wow. Um, and then I think it's really exactly that the, yeah. that the park service, the park service has taken, you know, took it over. I think that's mm -hmm. wonderful because it was, I mean, there, there were several versions of it actually, because they, some of them would go, go, um, into, into ruin. And in fact, one of them, oh, I think one of them, the third one they did, uh, if I remember right, remember right, the, the, that the canvas that was involved got got given to the the Indians, and I kept I think it on Iowa. I'm not sure that, and we was used for make teepees. So, yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> so I could in, go anyway, paint a teepee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That'd be so, so cool. So these every these things have a history. Even wow. recycled, they have a history. Right. And, and, but then there were also all these artists who painted the Civil War and were part of that. And, you know, yeah, you, you yeah. think about like these time marks and that's what the National Park Service has. And now like this then and now of artists going there, rediscovering roots and deepening their roots with their family and, and, and ancestral connections to, Hey, I see something completely new and different. And I record, you know, yeah. hermit crabs under the water. Um, you know, then you've got people like Alice Lease, who's a cattle rancher in West Texas, going all over the place, and her art is amazing. You got, you know, a veteran mm -hmm. Chip Beck. Chip Beck, we we can't talk about. Oh this yeah, art. Chip Beck. I mean, come on, he 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 is a veteran in in, in so many ways. His he should have a book out about him. He really should have a memoir. Do you think, Tanya? He should. You know, there's. I think there should be. Uh, it cartoonist. seems like they're already that should already be out there. Yeah, <laughs> you've got. Cartoonist, it seems like it should already artists. be written. <laughs> yeah, cartoonist, character artists. You've got like I look at all these different modes, and the cyclorama sits in the middle of it all. That's how I look at it. And then you've got people like <laughs> William, William Henry Jackson, an amazing photographer. His story is incredible, you know. And yeah, so he was, uh, he was amazing. We can't not yeah. mention him on this show. We have to. Well, you know, humans have <laughs> I mean, he inspired yeah. Congress. Oh, well. Yes. Okay, wait. Victoria, you go first on William Henry Jackson. <laughs> Victoria, did, did, did you, you say me? Okay. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm sorry. Um, I was, I, I didn't hear you at first. Um, yes, yes. He was, he was an inspired, uh, Congress, you know, was one of the, one of the direct, uh, 
direct people who contacted and they used his photographs. I mean, he was an amazing photographer. He was, he was doing it. He was doing it with a horse drawn wagon at first. And, um, wow. Oh, golly. Uh, I think he's interesting because not only did he do that, he, after he lived to be a ripe old age, I think he was 99. I'm not sure about when he died, but up to that, his, when he was seven in his seventies, he started a new career. And that was, he took up painting, which he had never done before, <laughs> and he became very successful. And um, is it Scott's Bluff, I think, National yes. Monument, mm -hmm. that has um, a wing where all his paintings have been placed. Mm -hmm. So that is cool. I mean, he's, he excelled in two mediums. Uh, and they were really um, very different from one from the other. And he was successful at both. So... I found it interesting that he went from photography to painting. And uh, Tanya, yeah. would you ever do that? Did, I mean, have you learned to paint? I think I, I remember one show, you coming on one podcast saying you were starting to learn how to paint. Oh, well, uh, most recently I've been trying watercolor painting, which uh, for me is the hardest <laughs> medium that I have ever worked yeah. with. That so, is not easy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I <agree>. boy. Really, <laughs> yeah. It's called a happy accident. <laughs> yeah. Let me just pour my water right on top of it. That would There's be There's very little control compared to like oil painting or pen and ink or charcoal or pencil drawing. The, the paint just runs where it wants to. <laughs> yeah. However, I've seen Nancy work a palette knife like you wouldn't believe. She's like, here, I will give you cake. Here's your icing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I've seen you do that. Let me just cut it up on the canvas. I mean, it's pretty no, amazing. It's like, it is like, yeah. It's such Let me cut sneaky. your face up on the palette knife on the yes. canvas. Like here, here's your portrait. Ooh. <laughs> because, I mean, the, okay. No, the palette so, knife thing is amazing when, to me. Yeah. I, I just have to throw this in before I forget the interior museum. So the Department of Interior has a museum, the Interior Museum, who has Mm -hmm. a lot of the works and when the interior museum i think if memory serves when they were opening they went to william henry jackson um and mm -hmm. i think he did four paintings of the surveys of the american west yes yes um oh. so those are i think they are still unless they're on tour i think it might even be a virtual tour still in the interior museum Mm. So I know I've mentioned them twice, but but it it is um, I'm pretty sure that um, they are there right now. Yeah, people should check it out because it, his work is phenomenal, and he, he I mean it is. Um, I want to go to one thing we haven't discussed, and this is interesting because I think it showcases when tourism illustrations became kind of an art form. Like if you think about Route 66 and neon signs, like, you know, we're doing this whole project with the Jefferson Highway. I mean, there's, you know, roadside mon monuments and oddities and weird things to see on the side. Come on, it's fun, right? We want to go see the weird things <laughs> and the interesting things. Like the thing between Tucson and <laughs> New Mexico, the thing. Got to go see the mummy. Go to the thing. Yes. Um, oh, gosh, yes. <laughs> yeah, everybody must go to the thing. Um, so there's those. But I think there's this this history of travel in our country that is very interesting and in how illustration is part of it, how tourism guides were created. And just there's something really cool about the old school way. It's like I'm a fan of Mad Magazine because of the art <laughs> in it, because of the because right. it's funny. You know, and yeah. it's clever. And yeah, you, Victoria, you and I are of the same cloth of all of that stuff. <laughs> and I am. Um, well, just... you know what, what, what you're saying reminds me that, that we did a, we did a, a, a article on posters. And most of them, mm -hmm. most of them were posters that were, were done, or earliest ones were done by, the trail, the the railroads, because they were trying, you know, because of the national parks. Now they were trying to really promote travel because people had something to see that would be spectacular. 
And mm-hmm. so the early post is really good. And then the ones that were done in, well, like, like the Art Deco posters in the 1930s, I mean, those were fabulous, fabulous posters. Mm-hmm. And of, well, of, the, um, uh, I'm even thinking about, I mean, we can't forget the Fred Harvey in, right. in this either yes. with the railroad. So, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah the Harvey. Yeah, he gone. did it easy to travel. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, he sure did. And there's there's some guy now <clears throat> that came along later that was reproducing those posters. I think he was it was he was called Ranger Dan or somebody. But but he mm-hmm. he 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 was doing later versions, which were really really nice. And there's other companies now. I mean, now people are trying to replicate that same vibe. And it's even when you think about the signs when you go into parks, like the old lodges and the way it was the old wood signs. You, you guys, you, Tanya, you know that is, uh-huh. in, you know, right? Those old lodge kind of looks. Yeah. Like you're here now. Um, and I think there's art in that too about the signage. Yeah. The posters went with it. There was a vibe. It's, it's, It's really interesting because um, when we think of the National Park Service interpretation and signage before um, the Italian uh, illustrator was hired by the National Park Service, oh gosh, I can't remember his name right now, Um, but there was a point in the Park Service where all of that was was standardized uh, because they hired uh, famous, I should probably Google it before I open my mouth. Hmm. Yeah. Oh, that sounded interesting. That was, who was that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Bring that I'm back. sorry, my, my, yeah, I'm, was, I'm sorry. I'm trying to keep up with you here. You mentioned no, something I think, that I have never heard of. So I've got the computer and I apologize. No, no, oh, I thought that's okay. Yeah, somebody, oh, no. I thought it was someone's Alexa going off there or whatever. Or Google. <laughs> well, that's, that's so funny. funny. That's, that's what it was. Yeah, it was. <sighs> Well, back to the the question of where is the, you know, when did the illustration become art? And when, you know, I think now we can all agree since the discussion was 100 years ago about, um, you know, illustration is an art. But for a lot of people, it still is. Where are you coming at the art from? Are you, is there a goal? Are you selling something? Or are you saying this is an artwork in and unto itself? Um, you know, and so a lot of these famous painters also did illustration. Even George O'Keefe did illustration. Yeah. Um, so you, when you think when you when you think of that, but especially with the Park Service, when and and please, if you're on the computer, please look up who this who this uh, person was that they hired. And it was very good. But now we're kind of in the curve with the Park Service going back to um, the legacy of the look before that, um, Ah, before that was standardized. And I can't even remember if it was in the 50s or 70s right now, but um, the the Park Service with their interpretation. No, Rob Decker, Mm, we interviewed him. I can't remember. That's a different one. Sorry, I didn't mean to. Yeah. Okay, keep going. (laughs) Sorry. Um, yeah. Oh, no, I'm trying to, I'm just trying to remember this, this, um, this artist's yeah. name, but there, there is, this is real. I mean, artists and even still from Europe, especially, there is a very different, um, yes, definitely, uh, thought process about the arts. So all of these, the artists that came out for all of those different schools of arts that, that were reflecting nature in the parks or what were to become the parks, still we're kind of leaning on Europe a little bit for those, those mm-hmm. kinds of things. But it, it is an interesting question. When did the illustration become art? Was it art in the first yeah. place or because it had a theme and was selling something? Um, where is that? And then with the parks, you do get Fred Harvey, and then you're into the Fred I Harvey buildings, which <laughs> moves to Mary you know, Coulter. You did. Who is it? Who is okay. it? <laughs> you I found think, him. Um, mayor Fiorelli Laguardia's favorite project. I don't know. That was a mayor, but um, there it was Ranger Doug. By the way, Victoria Ranger Doug. I got that. Yeah. Um, 
but there was this whole program. I mean, the poster division and it, but it was started uh, by Mayor Fiorello. So LaGuardia's like it was really a group by that name. Um, the post, there's a, there were poster divisions there. Like this is a whole like business kind of deal. That's a whole history. That's a whole other thing. It's all, yeah, that's one collection, but, uh, it was Ranger Doug, but there were original WPA posters is what they, there was, but yeah. people are reproducing it now. So it's really hard. So people come up, thanks to Google and AI of people of today. So I, I'm trying to get past the today stuff. Rob Decker does a good job. Um, he was on our show with yeah. his, his, um, posters. He, he's, he's good, but trying to find your Italian dude is not easy. Um, Here, <laughs> I, I, I think I, I, I think I found him. I did type in Italian. Massimo dude, Vinelli. Oh, well, Ooh, that sounds nice. nice. <laughs> I like it. It's not related to I Millie think, Vanilli. I think uh, Massimo Vinelli. Oh, wow. So, um, wow. I'm just, I'm just Googling right now. So I'm going to put his you name know, I, in. I, it, I, maybe. Mm-hmm. Go ahead, Victor. It seems like, well, I mean, we're t- just talking about when did, when did posters become art or when did illustration become, become art? And I think it always has been, but it hasn't always been perceived as, oh gosh, that's something you want to hang in your home. You, you see it and you like it, but they say that's a nice poster. And it was always good it. as advertising. Except, it's advertising. Except, yeah. Ex- well, it's communication. Like, like it's more blatant communication than other kind of pictures, but. Mm. But I think I think the the national park posters are in a special category because because they capture the imagination of the people going to see them and they can't maybe they can't afford a, a, a you know a picture uh, they they mm-hmm. take a they take a photograph but uh, but they put it in an album so they got <laughs> you know they don't make a blow up of it they uh, they want something that that reminds them of their trip and they wind up buying a poster. And, yes. and those, I mean, uh, because, because it speaks to them. People collect things of mm-hmm. their park experiences. That's why the, the, the stamping of your passport and they collect them t-shirts, all of it. It's, it's memorabilia. Yeah. People collect the yeah. brochures when you go in, they collect them. I know mm-hmm. people who have made uh, their brochures, like they've gone to all 63 parks and made it into a, you know, a, a coffee table thing. You know, right. it's a big coffee yeah. table. You know, they do things. And I, I love that. I think, you know, that's your memories and in your, you right. know, I mean, Nancy and I travel full time. We can't do any of that fun stuff. It's all digital now, which, <laughs> it, which kind of, you, you know, it's great, but that's, you know, it, look at the progression of what is. I mean, back in the day when they were traveling, they couldn't take a bunch of stuff either. You know, it's it's a yep. very interesting thing, and it's interesting to see the artists now because now temporary art is part of the world now too, which is really fascinating to me. About here, you see this art, and it's gone the next few days, gone, and that's like yep. a hard thing for me because I want to see it again. You know, it's like really good wine, and then the wine is gone, and then you're like upset because now the wine's gone and it's a new vintage, maybe better, it may not. <laughs> But like you want to, I'm still chasing a certain mole in Mexico. I cannot get it back. And that is the power of art, right? Mm -hmm. Because no matter what, there is a form of temporary with art. It's like, you can't look at it all day and keep having that same feeling, you know, but it is, um, it's powerful. And the fact that there's still artists is great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Even, you know, Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was, I was just say thinking, even when you experience, <laughs> when, when, when you experience it, you experience it and you look at it again sometime later, now you're going to have a different experience. It's maybe not going to be quite mm-hmm. the way you saw it the first time because you've had different experiences in the meantime and you've related, exactly. you're relating to it differently. differently. Yes, that's exactly. Nancy, go ahead. 
And that, uh, to the just, audience, it, we can't see each other. So just so you know, sorry, we're not interrupting on purpose. So we can't see um, each other. It, even it, if you think before photography, um, somebody sat down one day and, you know, discovered a pencil and paper and decided to draw, or they were in a cave and they found out how to make paint. They had a desire to leave something somewhere for others to see. Mm. And it's lasted for so many centuries of people that have a desire to produce something for other people to either hear or read or see. And, and, you know, for, for art to still be as important now as back then you know, gaining and gaining and gaining in importance this is a form of communication that um pretty much take it doesn't take in everybody because some people don't see but then they could probably hear music when you look at art and you look at music and you look at at writing those three things take in almost everybody. Right. I want to, I want right. to go back to Tanya too. Um, she was talking about Massimo Vignelli. Um, Vignelli, he did the brochures for when you went in. He did the art on the brochures, which is different than the posters that you were buying for your home. A little bit different, but they, I think they both mm-hmm. have been merged at times throughout history, Tanya. I think, um, you just sent me a link and everyone will be linked in the episode notes. Um, but Tanya, isn't that he did both, right? Um, or did he do like the yes, ones? and and he 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 did both. He was hired by our government um, to set the standards for the National Park Service by, for lack of a better term, again marrying the illustrative side um, and the standards for illustration, which means measurements and those different things with the artwork itself. Mm. So he brought those two things together for us, um, which I think is a really hard job, by the way. <laughs> so I agree. Um, I can't even imagine. And he just passed away in 2014. So I think he must have been hired in the late 60s or 70s. I can't remember, and I'm not, not looking at the computer anymore about it. But, um, yeah. yeah. Um, and the the... The standards for to communicate for interpretation in the parks is important because they have to find the common denominator. Mm. Yeah, that's that's the thing to about be able their to communicate. I always said their interpretation is not biased, right? It's like this has to go to the general public. It's not biased. It is this is the fact. This is this, and so when it comes to art, that's a interesting like thing to be able to do it's not opinionated as such right it's not like oh i like this you know um so it's really i think what you do tanya dealing with you know the national park service and artists and you know the park service is like this is what we have to do because we represent america right and here comes the artist going i want to do this 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 you're like that's really cool and I don't know if that's going to fly, but I'll try and do this. You know what I mean? You, what you do is incredible <laughs> to balance it all out, um, and, and make artists happy. And, you know, I think it is just, it's amazing when we've talked about this today, how art has just changed through the ages. I think that's the bigger conversation today and how our parks are connected, whether an artist is painting a civil war scene or, you know, an, an artist was doing a poster to represent a park. Like this is going to be the, it's like creating a postage stamp here. This is going to represent it to all the masses. One image. Holy cow. I don't want to be tasked with that. Are you kidding me? That's insane. Maybe it's like doing the front cover of a magazine, right? Oh, this front cover has to represent everything in there. That's the worst part of being in our industry, right? Is trying to do the front cover. Don't you think? It's difficult. <laughs> well, it, you, because I have, it's, I like, have, it's a personal 
your personality comes into the choices that you make. Yeah. That's hard. So we do all have biases. And even Mm -hmm. though we're not supposed to, we probably, I mean, I can only speak for myself, but I have biases that I don't even know are there. So I would, (laughs) if I was, you know, having to do a layout like that, I certainly would not even know I was doing it and have biases and need something, need the signature on the lower right hand corner, you know, like that, that kind of thing. So I have um, something pretty exciting to tell you that I just want to throw in here. So Sean McLeod, who is um, with the New York, um, I'm sorry, New York Institute of Dance and Education, and uh, Siswan Yang, an artist mm. who you have interviewed, yes. they are putting a project together. So I just wanted to, to throw that in that even, and they're from different sides of the world, that mm-hmm. awesome. these being inspired by the parks, and these artists coming together, and you're absolutely right. Like the the artists that uh, you know we've been able to sponsor and host at the parks, and even people on our advisory boards, all kinds of they are coming together and they are creating their own magnificent works. I can't even catch up with them. I really can't because they're making those connections among each other. Well, the I National love Parks Arts Foundation, and we can't I'm even so- catch up. On social media, I'm always seeing you're like posting shows with people doing this. I mean, we did the, uh oh, was it the Arctic or the Antarctica group? Come on, like, and Michelle was part of it. Oh Michelle yeah, that's right. Um, I don't remember which poll it was, but it was cold. And they're together, and I'm going, look at all these people pairing up together all through this, the NPAF, you know. And I think that's amazing too because it's just, it just science has been part of it and reading you know the ice melting and artists making music out of it. i'm like how what okay this is cool you know i love that part of how big the arts have become through through technology through um instruments through like actual tools like we were talking about in the beginning the you know paint has changed you went from oil to acrylics photography has changed from did you know now we're digital you know, all of that stuff, you know, is absolutely amazing. Um, so I think the that tools is so cool. have changed, but mm-hmm. what else is, has changed are the venues. And so what Victoria is doing is so important because um, with all of these new tools, new media is created. And by media, I mean artistic media. I don't mean the press. Artistic media is is created and even tools with just two-dimensional painters so victoria putting this museum together gives a venue that is another step in the process of being able to express our inspiration of nature or whatever our inspiration is if it weren't for people like victoria artists would not have a place to be able to have an audience Mm. i agree well so, very go, important. Go, go, Victoria. Very Keep kind working. Of you. <laughs> yeah. it's very kind of you. It's, it's hard. So. What, what Victoria is doing and, and rallying people together and people supporting and doing, I mean, it's, it's, it's a team. And, you know, Victoria, I mean, you've been working on this for a while. It's a, okay. it's a big deal. And you're representing well, a region too, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because we are in an area, um, well, it's, 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 I mean, I don't like to use the wild, word wilderness because it's not that, but it is extremely rural. And southwest New Mexico is way different than the Santa Fe area. Uh, it has, it has its own kind of beauty and, um, and lifestyle and, uh, attitudes. So, um, and it, whereas, whereas art was started very early in the Santa Fe area because because people came there, artists came there because it was they'd heard about it. Uh, we we are starting from a, a a place of no art, no art. Even though we have lots of artists and lots of uh, lots of galleries, we just don't have a museum. And I I just think that's really important for us to to know to use to know the history of uh, because there's. 
so much to express. So our museum is not Southwest art in, in content. It is Southwest art because of where, where the museum is. And we are, we, we are specializing in American art. And, uh, we, we chose that simply be, and by American, I mean any, any artist that worked in this, on this continent, kind of, uh, so, so it ranges from, from, uh, from Native American art to, to any, any artist who's, who's come here and created, created a, a vision of what, what they've seen. So whatever, whatever medium they use, and we, we are, we are, grateful for people giving us really good examples of visual art. Mm. In closing, um, you know, with Victoria, what she is doing with the Southwest Regional Museum of Art and Art Center in Silver City. Everyone check it out, southwest-art-museum.org, link in show notes. I wanted to go back to Tanya on this because, you know, Silver City is this wonderful art community, um, but it's like, when you have a fine art museum open up, it is like like we're getting real now as being an art destination, being an art community, an art city. Uh, so, Tanya, is that the same kind of thing for artists um, in residence with the National Park Service? Because sometimes our art also ends up being part of the archives and part of museums, right? So is that kind of that same kind of, yeah, for everybody when that happens? Yeah, I mean, it ultimately is the business side of art, and it is the, if it is the artist's intention, which we have to take into consideration when accepting, you know, artists into museums or what, what the intention of the artist is. If it weren't for the museums, there wouldn't be a hub to actually see the work in person mm. and I think that that is still very important and if it weren't for museums like Victoria has then uh, artists wouldn't have anywhere to do that and right now it is a very opportunistic time because there can be pop-up things and different things but the standard museum is still the gem of any city I think really and often quite better than even, I won't say which Guggenheim, but even better than the larger museums. And I think that that has to do with the it, it being a little bit um, less stringent on acceptance. And so what I find with um, various museums, like that Silver City is just, you know, it's ripe for Victoria, you're doing a wonderful thing is that they have been these smaller towns have been a lot more accepting to uh, to uh, collect for ascensions of different demographics than larger museums, which harkens back to why male artists are showing up from the past more than female artists because they were worth more monetarily to museums than women artists were. Um, wow. And still are, unfortunately. Mm. So wow. on that note, that's, yeah. that's not a very positive <laughs> note to end on, but it's getting better and we're doing our best. Yes. <laughs> I would say everybody on this show is doing their best. And I think what Victoria is doing is amazing. And it just, it does still tie into the parks. Right. And I think, you know, all the oh, people yeah. we're talking about in the parks today, we wouldn't know about if it wasn't for museums and if it wasn't for these programs and the national parks wouldn't be here for art mm -hmm. without art. So um, <laughs> celebrate the arts in parks. Uh, Victoria is here every third Saturday. Please keep up with her at victoriachick.com. Also here on bigblendradio.com. And we do our first Friday parks in the art show with the national parks arts foundation. We hear different artists who are in residency or we're chatting with Tanya about what's coming up in residency programs and um, it's always fun. So keep up with us at BigBlendRadio.com. Go to NationalParksArtsFoundation.org to learn more. And as we were talking about at the beginning of the show, we're creating this digital retrospective of artist uh, interviews uh, that we've done over the eight years. And also we're putting together Victoria's um, articles and podcasts that she's done over the years regarding these artists in parks. And this is all coming out 
for the National Park Service anniversary on August 25th. And in that note, we better get the heck off of this show because we got work to do, y'all. Thank you all. Keep up with us at BigBlendRadio.com and go to BlendRadioNTV.com or NationalParkTraveling.com to sign up for our newsletter so you can make sure you get the retrospective. Also, NationalParksArtsFoundation.org does an awesome newsletter as well. Thank you both for joining us. Thank you for Thanks, all guys. the work you do. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you, everyone. You. Yes. <laughs> Thank you for listening to Big Blend Radio. You can view Victoria Chick's artwork at victoriachick.com. Keep up with us at bigblendradio.com. <laughs>